Welcome everyone. My name is Kent Scorney. I'm the president of Crilogy here in St. Louis. And I want to welcome you to this What's Next in Your Financial Health webinar. I've joined, been joined by some uh, friends and experts in uh, different areas of, uh, of estate planning, tax planning, and uh, wealth management and investment planning. And uh, really the, the, the impetus of this webinar was uh, started by our friends uh, at St. Louis Magazine where we were discussing you know, a lot, there, there's a lot of uncertainty out there and uh, we're trying to figure out ways to bring wellness to all aspects of our lives during uh, this, uh, this uh, COVID season. And uh, the, the goal today is just to give you information and uh, give you information in, in, in several different areas um, from our panel of experts. So let's get into it. Let's uh, introduce our panel. First, we have my teammate and, uh, and uh, uh, senior vice president here at Crilogy, Kristen Poole. She's a wealth advisor. She's a member of our investment committee. Uh, she's a certified financial planner, been in the business for 15 plus years, uh, works with high net worth individuals and families, helps them craft portfolios to meet their goals, but she really specializes in uh, education, partnership, and service with our clients. Um, she's also a, a five-star wealth manager, um, and she's an adjunct professor at Washington University teaching wealth management. Uh, we also have Rich Wygon, uh, CPA, senior uh, partner at SFW Partners here in St. Louis. Uh, Rich brings 25 years of experience in a wide range of accounting, tax, management, consulting, he helps in uh, industries with construction, real estate, hospitality, both hotel and restaurant, non-profit and uh, employee benefit plans. Um, and then Jennifer Davis, attorney and officer at Greensfelder, Hempker and Gale. She's a member of the firm's trust and estate practices group. She works with clients ranging from business owners, multi-generational families to some of the region's largest financial institutions. Jennifer's adept at taking complex estate and tax planning matters and applying them to the client's needs. She's uh, helped individuals and families with issues related to estate planning, uh, charitable planning, probate and trust administration, family business entities, succession business planning, and wealth preservation strategies. So welcome all. Really glad to have you. And um, I think this is gonna be a, a great conversation for the next 45 minutes or so. Um, the way we're going to do it to our, to our, um, in terms of how it's going to work, we're not going to do a QA. and a uh, We're going to hold that off uh, till the end and we're going to give contact information for our panelists so that you can direct the questions directly to them. We've done lots of webinars over the last uh, several months and I think that's probably the most impactful way so you can get your answers uh, directly from the experts. Uh, the goal today is to be conversational. Uh, I'm going to bounce some questions to and from our experts and um, and we'll go from there. So let's start out with the uh, Kristen Pool. Let's start with uh, the thing we talk about most, which is the markets, the economy, and um, you know, in, in your and in, in you sit on our investment committee, and and I attend those meetings. You know, we we talk about a lot about what's happening in the economy, and um, what what does history tell us about the years following an economic crisis that we're we're going through and or have just witnessed. Well, uh, history tells us something we've already actually seen, that recoveries are robust following market corrections or any significant downturn. They can be very fast and they're also highly unpredictable. So this really gets to the heart of having the importance of having a good plan and sticking to it even when things get tough in the market because if we knew when the recovery would come, and how much the recovery would be, we could all plan for it and perhaps retire a little earlier. But we just have to stick with our portfolios that are really well diversified and live through the tough times so that we can benefit from that equity exposure when the recovery comes. Yeah, I think it's interesting. Markets such that, that we're living through really test your resolve of your portfolio strategy. and. You know, Acrylogy manages you know, almost 1.4 billion. And, uh, you know, as money managers, we, we are not uh, immune to having emotional uh, responses to market drops. Um, even today, the market's down 600 as we speak. And, um, you know, we, we worry about uh, being stewards of our, of our clients' money, but it, 
we still have to be uh, very disciplined in our approach in terms of staying invested and staying allocated in the proper way. That's right. And I think you bring up a good point, which is emotion. You know, I think we've all heard the advice that we should take emotion out of investing. And I actually think that's terrible advice. We are human beings, so we are emotional and we can't ignore those feelings. But what we can do is have meaningful conversations with experienced advisors to make sure that we're aware of how our emotions are impacting our thinking, where the fear is likely to come into our decision making and still make sometimes emotional, but often still disciplined, good, strong, long-term decisions that are going to help us meet those goals that we've articulated well in advance of these frightening times. Exactly, exactly. The other major topic that's out there today, and Rich and Jennifer, this is gonna be really built to you, uh, the CARES Act. What is it? And I know that's a huge question, but what is it? How does it impact uh, clients, maybe on a more individual basis? But Rich, let's just start with you. Define the CARES Act for us and in, in from, from what you see. Yeah, so the CARES Act, uh, you know, CARES stands for the Corona Aid Relief and Economic, and Economic Security. Um, Act. It's a $2 trillion uh, bill that was passed and signed into law. Um, there's a whole bunch of different programs that was within that. Probably one of the most talked about and most popular was the, the PPP loan. Um, but there was a whole bunch of other things involved as well. So um, the stimulus checks that people got that was in there. Um, so a whole bunch of different things. Uh, uh, and, you know, and it was really meant, well, you know, to really soften the blow to, to you know, most of the people that need the help. Uh, but it was also meant to stimulate the economy and, and to make sure that we didn't go deep, deep into recession. So, you know, it was a, a twofold to help people and also to make sure our economy was able to rebound um, quickly, I guess. Essentially, it was, you know, a way to just inject as much cash as we can get into the economy. Jennifer, what do you, you know, I know a lot of people when they hear about the CARES Act, they think of it as a, you know, business and employee uh, bill, but there's much more to it and it impacts virtually every aspect of someone's uh, personal wealth plan and estate plan. Can you speak to that? I'm happy to um, address a couple topics that I see impacting the families I work with. Um, this is a, a great place where I think Rich um, and I both work together with those families. Um, so from an estate planning perspective, many of my families have a charitable intent and the CARES Act um, gave opportunities for my fa the families I work with to increase their charitable giving. Um, there is now what we call an above the line um, deduction. So if you, if you uh, don't itemize, you now have the opportunity to um, offset some income, 300 for individuals, and we believe that 600 um, for, uh, for married couples. Also with the, the families with which I work, um, and I'll, I can talk about this uh, more later, but there are provisions that um, address RMDs, those required minimum distributions. Um, and again, this is you know where, Rich, I'm, I'm curious to your thoughts, um, because there's opportunities to defer taking those RMDs if you don't meet the income, but then there's also opportunities to have access to the retirement accounts uh, if you need those funds and you meet certain qualifications. It's, it's really aimed at those directly in impacted by uh, the, the times we're in right now. Um, Rich, what are your thoughts on those retirement plan yeah, um, opportunities? Yeah, so, you know, we're, you know, as, as especially, so RMDs are for people that are 70, they reach 70 and a half, and they're required to take a certain percentage of their retirement accounts out every year, uh, which is the required minimum distribution. That, that's been suspended for 2020. Um, but we still are having conversations with our clients about whether you want to really suspend that or not. Because uh, if you have a large retirement account, you got to remember that 
something that happened earlier this well, late last year was um, that they got rid of the stretch IRAs. So we want to make sure if if you're going to have an inheritance of, of of retirement accounts, you know that that we're really planning on tax brackets because obviously we're in a graduated tax bracket scenario. We don't want to even though nobody likes to pay taxes if they don't have to, um, sometimes it's better to pay a little bit of tax than to pass a, a larger burden on to the next generation. So, so yeah, it's, it's always a question. You know, we always look at that and um, have that discussion. And, uh, you know, because sometimes people get so laser focused on let's defer taxes, defer taxes, defer taxes as long as we can. And then you get to a point where, um, it's hard, you can't defer it anymore. And, and then there's a big tax bill coming due, so. And I would also add, not to try to predict the future, but somehow we're gonna have to pay for this $2 trillion tax bill. <laughs> and the easiest yeah. way to do that is taxes. So, you know, taxes are not gonna go down any, any, any soon, anytime soon. So this is a $2 trillion tax bill. The US government collects about 2 trillion a year in taxes and in income taxes and about another 1.3 in payroll taxes. So this is a whole year's worth of tax. I mean, so to make that up is, I mean, I just hope we don't see a doubling of our tax bills, you know, to make this up, but you know, it's gonna have to be paid over some period of time. Absolutely. I know many of my, uh, the families with which I work are discussing that. How, how are they going to, how is the government going to find that revenue again? Um, in my, from my view, 2020 has been about retirement accounts with Congress. Um, it started with the Secure Act and um, its implications, and now in in the way I interact with families, um, the CARES Act has important uh, provisions that give them flexibility. But you have to look, looking at it globally is uh, is uh, important for the long term. Yeah, for sure. Wonderful. Let's let's pop back into the market, Kristen. And um, you know, you have a good, great question here. Is there anything about the current market movement that's different? Um, give us a sense of what what you see from from your desk. Well, I think the one thing that we can predictively say about every market downturn is the standard publications that we all read for stock market updates will tell us that this time it's different. <laughs> and uh, I think that's always frightening advice because every time is different, but the rules we need to follow to really stay disciplined to meet those long-term goals, they stay the same. So uh, the thing that I think is different this time, and this kind of goes back to some of our discussions of families and estate planning, I think that while other downturns may have been more economically driven, this has so many implications for every member of the family, every kid that didn't get to go to graduation, every new mother and father that didn't get to parade the grandkids around. And I think that that actually provides an interesting opportunity for those families that have been looking for ways to educate the kids about financial planning or estate planning I think this can be a good time to start having those conversations to tell adult children and maybe even some, you know, younger adolescent children, hey, you know, mom and dad have been planning for downturns in the market. We have goals set for the long run and we have um, safeguards built into our portfolios. We have advisors that have worked, walked us through multiple scenarios and everything's going to be okay. So I think the big thing that I see that's so different this time is uh, anxiety that pervades the entire family. And because so many clients ask us, how can we, it's the one question that I feel I'm least prepared to answer sometimes, how can I make sure my children have the values, especially around money that are important to my family maybe this is an opportunity to start to have some of those discussions about security, the future of the family and values. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great point. I've had many conversations with, um, 
you know, parents that have spoken to uh, just how disruptive emotionally this is for teenagers, younger ones as well, but for sure teenagers and higher and, and older, and um, and to the point where you have to worry about, um, you know, their stress level. They've already have stress. Their world's been turned upside down. Um, you know we work from home, they're going to school from home, which none of us went through that. And we, it's hard for us to even coach them uh, through those, through those moments. Uh, but then they also hear and watch the news, um, whether it's, it's probably not on, you know, NBC, the way we might get it, it's going to be through their social apps. But, um, you know, they understand that there's risk out there in the economy and they understand yeah. that there is a certain amount of fear. Um, so a lot of the, the conversations have been around, we're okay. You know, we're going to get through this. A lot of us folks have been through these these type of situ situations before, and it's going to be just fine. So I think that's a that's a that's a great point. Um, Rich, there's so many different provisions to the CARES Act. Where do you even start with clients when you're trying to figure out, you know, best way to be the most efficient on their tax return for 2020? I mean. You know, there's so many different changes to it. Where do you, where do you begin? Yeah, there's really is. I mean, so, you know, we take a focused approach and look at, you know, what, um, you know, is it a business client or an individual client? And then, you know, look at the different provisions. You know, there's a number of provisions, both on the individual side, as well as the business side. Um, you know, for our, you know, like our individual clients, you know, we're, we're definitely, as Jennifer was talking about, looking at, you know, the retirement plan distributions, there is a provision, you know, it's a really a hardship provision, but you are able to take, um, if you are, you know, impacted by COVID, um, which I don't know, almost, I can't imagine many people aren't, uh, you can take up to $100,000 of uh, distributions from your retirement accounts and then without penalty, and then either pay the tax on that over three years you can pay it over one year if you want. You can elect to pay it over three years, or you can um, borrow it and essentially pay it back within the three-year time frame. And so it gives people some flexibility if they do have some short-term need for cash that isn't sitting in their regular investment accounts or their savings. And, and is that a hundred percent up to a hundred thousand? So if you had a hundred thousand, you could pull all hundred out. Yeah, you can. Yeah, mm -hmm. Which is a unique. I mean, that's a big change. It's it's really unique. It's a yeah different. Uh, thing. And again, I think they were just looking at uh, ways to help people soften the blow and, and right. you, know, you know, get rid of that big burden of the 10% penalty um, and then allowing people to spread that tax over three years uh, again if needed. And, and then there are some people probably in that tax, you know, if they're getting closer to retirement, um, there might be some strategies there also about getting money out of your account. Um, and, and doing some other conversions to Roths and different things like that as well. Um, but, you know, while the tax rates, what we feel are probably historically low right now, um, if we expect them to go higher in the future, then, you know, if you're in the right tax bracket now, a lower one, you know, maybe doing some conversions might be a good strategy. Mm -hmm. Jennifer, for our clients that we see out there are really forward thinking, you know, the, the, the market drops, you know, their, their business or their, uh, their career uh, might be adjusted in some way, shape or form, but then they go further and say to themselves, okay, what about my state plan? What, what, what can I be doing? Are there other legislative changes that other than the, the CARES Act that are out there that is, that is sort of put someone, an individual to motivate them to, to work on their estate plan? Um, so there's an interesting question, uh, and it, it's it's certainly relevant because many of uh, our clients are thinking uh, into the future. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the first part of the year was planning for the Secure Act um, that had fundamental changes uh, to the options available to many individuals who have large retirement accounts, and people are saving for retirement, um, and those accounts were growing. And the SECURE Act, while it had uh, provisions beyond just who you could leave the retirement accounts to and how, it fundamentally changed that. Um, and so we spent the first part of the year working with people about that and if that's something that they should still consider. 
But as you mentioned earlier, those clients that are looking ahead realize that the government is, is going to have to find funds to pay for these bills. They also are keenly aware of the political landscape and how that could change in 2020. And so one of those sources of revenue is the estate tax. Um, the good news is it's at an all-time high for an exemption. So that means just a fraction of society uh, is impacted by it. Um, even if it goes down, while that fraction increases, it's still a small fraction. But clients are aware of that. They're also aware that we're at a historical all-time low with interest rates. So there's lots of opportunities, Kent, and, and things that people are thinking about that have, go beyond even the CARES Act. Can you give us, Jennifer, just a an example of a technique that you might use to help uh, mitigate a state. Let's just, let's go, uh, you know, when I started in my career, the estate tax exemption was, I think it was two and a half million. I mean, it was, it, it was Good low. Job. Yeah. It was like 500,000 when I was I started. Was, I was say it was 600,000 for me, which makes me feel a little bit, uh, a little older than you. So, um, but yes. you know, let's let's assume it goes down to five million, um, or two and a half million, or even a million. I mean, it's easy to tax people who are deceased, right? It's the easiest legislation to pass through. So, you know, what are techniques that people should be thinking about and considering? Well, first, even if it, as a reminder, even if it goes down to the half a million, it, that is going to impact um, a number of families, particularly our closely held business owners. So that's very important. Um, but. It, if it goes down lower, then it, it becomes more important. And so even what we consider um, basic estate planning can help maximize those exemptions that they give you. One thing I always uh, like to talk about as something simple, because some of the techniques get quite advanced um, and, and sophisticated, and they, they use those interest rates that the IRS releases monthly. But what I always like to highlight is the ability to make loans to your family. Um, so even if you think it goes down to five million, and I have a more complex but still um, more uh, common estate plan, there are ways using that low interest rate where you can help your family today. This is really an opportunity, and I see many clients who again are looking to the future as a way to help their children buy a home or. Um, finance uh, an interest in a business and these low interest rates that the, that the federal government is is releasing each month are, are making that um, more of a gift. I was just sitting with a business owner yesterday and he's you know, considering you know, selling his company to, a, to, to his son and along with the real estate to the company to the son and we just had this conversation about those potential uses because of the low interest rate environment. I have a lot of families who have done that and they're looking at refinancing. Um, you, we, uh, it's amazing, um, 2012, uh, we had a number of sales because of potential changes in the estate tax. And the rate reduction by refinancing those loans is, is impactful. So um, it's something that I would urge uh, families who've done that to pull out those promissory notes and look at them. Wonderful. Uh, Kristen, there are, you know, the market dropped 30 plus percent in March and, uh, you know, quickly uh, regained. But when a market drops that significantly, there, there are planning opportunities inside those moments. That one was a little bit challenging because it was such a quick uh, drop. Yeah. But um, and this actually entails all three of you, I think. The tax loss harvesting is much more of an investment play, but like Roth conversions, concentrated stock positions. Talk to us a little bit about those, those ideas. Yeah, I, uh, I think when there are quick drops in the market, there's always a lot of activity for us as advisors, not only just talking people through, um, you know, what to do and why we're not going to pull all of our money out of equities. In fact, we're probably going to buy more equities, but really helping people to focus on the opportunities at hand, the planning strategies that we have that are gonna help their portfolios perform better in the long run. And so I think you named the key ones. You know, First, we have tax loss harvesting. If we have equities in a taxable account or really any assets and we can sell them 
buy something very similar, keep the similar thing for 30 days, and then on the 31st day, switch back to the original holding, the impact is, is really a tax deferral strategy that can be very meaningful and give clients a lot more control over which assets are taxed when. And it's not costly, they're still invested in the market. So that's always one of the first things we think of for clients. Um, Roth conversions are another strategy. We talked to quite a few folks about this year. Again, with income tax rates being historically low and the value of the assets we would consider converting being temporarily low as it turns out and that was the expectation at the time we had folks that could take some of those traditional ira dollars turn them into roth dollars by paying the income taxes and converting and now they have tax-free dollars which i think everyone on this panel would agree are our very favorite kind of dollars to be using in retirement or even better passing to the next generation absolutely so, i would also add that it's okay to to do the Roth cal calculations now. And if the market does pull back, you have those calculations ready. All you have to do is replug them in. And I know a lot of our advisors have been working on that. Well, Roth conversions are definitely something that are attractive to lots of folks all the time, regardless of stock prices. So uh, when we see that volatility in the market, it's just one more reason to consider it as a planning strategy. Right. Especially if we're all bearish on the current tax tax rates, we all believe are going to go in the wrong Absolutely. Place. And Kent, I'll just say the, I think the last strategy is the most important, which is rebalancing. When we have a target asset allocation, let's say 60% equities, 40% fixed income, and the market takes away 10, 15% of those equities or of the whole portfolio because of equity movement, we buy more equities to come back to that target portfolio. And that can be a frightening strategy, but we made the decision to have a certain asset allocation when you know we all had level heads and we weren't operating with fear and uncertainty. And so for those folks who took that leap and bought more equities to get back to their target allocations, now they've benefited from the spike in the market. And for some, we're rebalancing again to sell equities again, coming back to the target. Those are the disciplines that really help people to have uh, you know, the, right abil the right amount of risk for their ability, willingness, and need to take risk in the long run. And it can also uh, help returns over long periods of time. Absolutely. Rich, let's spend a little bit of time, uh, and Jennifer, on business owners. I know we've had, we have several business owners on the, uh, on the as participants in this webinar and um, especially with the CARES Act, I know there's been a lot of changes, deductibility of certain items. Um, you know, the PPP loan is, you know, you and I did a two hour uh, webinar when in, in the last hour and 15 minutes were questions about the PPP loan. It's been a little bit more clear as of late, but um, what are you seeing when you're speaking with business owners? Yeah, I mean, for sure the PPP loan has been, that's the Paycheck Protection Program. Uh, that's been the most significant, one of the most significant impacts to businesses from a action, uh, right? And there's other really significant things that we'll, I'll touch on here, but, you know, there was a real deadline on getting your application in. Uh, so everything, the world stopped and you had to get in it because the money was going to run out. And in fact, it did run out. And then Congress reauthorized like another thing. $300 billion or something. So it became like a $647 billion program. So, um, sorry. Uh, <clears throat> the, uh, my phone's ringing. I'm sorry. I don't know how to turn it off. <laughs> uh, but so that was something that was really time sensitive. Uh, but, you know, since it was reauthorized and it did get uh, additional funds, there's still some money left. So if people haven't participated in the PPP loan, there's still time to do it. Um, and then a lot of people shied away from it because of the rules were changing by the day. There was what was called IFRs, interim final rules, that, you know, you think interim final rule, well, it's, 
I, I hear the word final and rule that I think I'm done. There's like 14 of those. I mean, it yeah, was like yeah. crazy. They were changing all the time. So it was, uh, you know, to stay on top of that, that was uh, the biggest focus. The other really huge thing though that happened was when the uh, tax, uh, tax cuts and job act went into place, it was passed in 2017, effective for 2018. They did away with some of the net operating loss uh, carryover and carryback rules. And, and so it really um, limited, you know, when, when business owners had losses, uh, whether it's from depreciation or, or anything, uh, it limited their ability to, to take some of those losses. Well, this, uh, the CARES Act uh, repealed that temporarily for businesses. So you can now carry back your NOLs for five years, uh, go back and get real dollars back. Um, so that's a huge thing. Um, so you can start, you can even do that right now for um, 18 and amend 18's returns. And then if you haven't, if you filed 19 already, you can amend 19's return or, you know, if people are on extension, you can follow through. The other big thing, and this is in, in that tax cuts and job act was this, uh, this hiccup in the, in the law where they had a technical wording problem with what they consider qualified improvement property. So this is for all of our people that have heavy real estate. So, you know, commercial real estate, but it really impacted restaurants that, um, you know, do a lot of improvements to their properties uh, that used to be able to be written off under the um, accelerated depreciation tables and even including the bonus depreciation where you can take a one year write off. Um, because of the, they missed some words in the, in the original law and then Congress wasn't getting along and they weren't gonna fix it, we were stuck here. But CARES Act uh, did fix it. And so now qualified improvement property is now defined as um, anything with a 15 year life. It's basically the interior space of your build out. And, and now it allows you to take one year immediate write off and expensing of those improvements. Um, and so again, you can, if those, were in, if those improvements were put in place in 2018, 18's rule said you got to depreciate it over 39 years. So now you can go back and amend 18's return, generate that tax loss, get money back, you carry backs. Um, so again, another way to stimulate the economy by um, getting fresh money in it, so. Jennifer, 2020 is a presidential election year. Yes, it is. Probably the strangest one we're gonna ever witness with, um, you know, I, you don't really see um, campaign ads on TV. It's kind of it's crazy. I mean, there's a, there's a few, but there's just not that many. Um, you know, it's, it's a completely different, different game. But regardless of who wins, um, you know, what are some estate planning things that you're having, you know, the topics that you're discussing with your clients to prepare for the, the, the next administration? So the, the theme um, right now is, again, the low interest rates, the, the depressed values of clients' assets, particularly uh, by the, the business owners we work with, um, and the potential for that appreciation. Then you look at what's the future of the estate tax, and, and that is a highly political issue. So the, the first two are, are generating conversations, um, but they are um, prompting clients to, to look to the fall and, and how the political landscape may change the estate tax, and that is motivating clients to think about uh, techniques that they had hoped to put off um, the current estate tax legislation was set to sunset in 2026. Um, so, but I believe that clients are more aware that that could, could be sooner rather than later. And so they're looking at ways to shift their wealth to their family, um, take advantage of the all time high estate tax exemption, the all time low interest rates. And so, we're having a, a number of discussions about techniques that are more efficient than they've ever been with, with the current conditions. Do you feel um, 
as if activity amongst your clients is, is increased during this time? So, uh, yes. Um, the spring was, there was certainly, as, as Kristen, um, I think she did an excellent job talking about the emotional impact of um, this economic decline. Um, and so I had clients who um, had delayed follow-up with me for a long time and, and brought those documents back out, either to sign them or, or look at them again. You know, do they have the right people there? Do, do they want the money um, that they're leaving for their family to go as it is structured? Now, as people are becoming um, more comfortable uh, with our new reality and, and the, uh, you know, the, the virus, the coronavirus, we seem to be recovering um, and people are returning to work, um, they're looking to the future. And those, that's when we're beginning those conversations and having those conversations about ways to take advantage of some unique opportunities. Kristen, if, if the... Uh, Go ahead, Can I ask a follow-up question to that, Ken? Just, Jennifer, do you see like some clients um, hesitate because they don't want to be tied down to a really rigid, you know, estate plan? I mean, how do you deal with that fear of, well, what if I run out of money if I start transitioning wealth now? So that's an excellent question. Um, and one thing is, um, if you're giving something, you should assume it's gone. Um, but <laughs> so uh, there is, you know, certainly um, it's very important for any family to have comfort with what's being given um, and that it's, uh, it's being given in, in the right way. Um, we also have clients who um, are very worried because circumstances change. Um, so there, there are two worries that clients um, rich always need to discuss as part of this process. One is, is this an asset that you uh, can truly part with? And the answer doesn't have to be yes, because there are techniques where um, we can preserve some aspect of that. Um, for example, sales, where again, you're, you're really giving um, the appreciation and the income off that asset because there's the sale component. Now, as a close sale business, you are giving the right to vote and control the business. So you have to have that element. We have uh, gifts where you retain an income stream and you're really giving the future right to it. So we, we have options, Rich. Okay. Um, but once I get them to that comfort level, uh, they do want to make sure that they have as much flexibility as possible. Because again, they might be giving a gift a little sooner than they were planning and so they want, and we have, we have options for that to give them some flexibility, so. Perfect. And before we move to our next question, I'll address a question that I think crosses everyone's minds when we have a big election coming up, which is, which do the, does the stock market like better, Republicans or Democrats? <laughs> and I will put all of your minds at ease that the stock market does not care. Really, you know, there will be studies and articles every election that spin the information one way or another, because to say the same thing every election is really boring and it doesn't sell magazines and newspapers. But when they're, they have done really broad studies of equity performance after certain types of elections, whether it's left or right, whether it's an incumbent president or not, it is largely impossible to predict how the market will behave. And so, you know, if only all my clients heard, because half of my clients every four years tell me that perhaps we should be in a more conservative portfolio, because we know that if that person gets elected, literally, we have the conversation on both sides, we know the stock market's probably going to go down. So, yeah, I, I think I heard uh, someone say in investment committee a few weeks ago, the, the market is a reflection of uh, future earnings of our largest companies in the United States. It is nothing other than that. It is a pricing of that, of the future earnings. And, um, you know, it does not care about anything other than the future earnings of those organizations. So um, I, I totally Which agree. Is, and that's a difficult, somewhat counterintuitive um, idea to grasp. 
I would, I think of a month ago when it felt like the world was just coming down around us and the stock market starts marching upward. It can be really confusing, even Kent, as you know, sitting in investment committee meetings, even for professionals to think about the death and destruction around us and still see mark, strong market performance. And that truly is an illustration that the stock market is forward looking. It's not going to price what investors believe is happening today. It's pricing to what investors believe will happen in the coming six months, 12 months, 18 months. Exactly. And if the market goes down dramatically again, what can you do to your, what are some some techniques that you'll, you'll utilize in a portfolio to help mitigate some of the damage? Yeah, well, I, I think the, uh, uh, before we even get to that point of if the market does go down, where we can think about some of those strategies like selling concentrated stock positions, tax loss harvesting, rebalancing, I think now is a great time for people to realistically look at their portfolios and go back to basics. Do you have the right asset allocation? And really before that, I think the question is, do you know what your asset allocation is and why it was chosen? And if the answer is, I'm not sure, and I don't know why it was chosen, it's probably worth a phone call with an advisor to say, hey, does this make sense to me? Because you know, I don't think any of us think of asset allocation as just years until retirement anymore. Now we think of it as my ability to take risk, my need to take risk so that I can have higher returns, and my willingness to take risk. Am I comfortable if my, mark, if my portfolio moves a lot when the market moves a lot? And if someone says that it really ruins their day when they see the market go down, to me, that's a valid reason to have a conversation about whether it's the right asset allocation to begin with. And the second fundamental question I think is a good one to ask right now is, is my portfolio well diversified? Do I have US companies and international companies? Do I have small companies and large companies? We have seen incredible performance out of US publicly traded companies in the past 10 years. And it's benefited a lot of American investors. But it's so easy to forget that the 10 years before that, from 1998 to 2008, international companies outperformed. So what feels safe today because it's done well may not be what prepares us well for the coming 10 years. Yeah, it's, it's amazing how different asset classes will transition to leadership. Uh, depending on what's happening in the economy, in the world economy, really. And I do believe there are times when uh, clients will look at um, maybe inside their 401k or even just, um, you know, inside their portfolio saying we should get out of this fund or an investment because it's lagging, sure. you know, with what one of the large cap tech companies might be doing at the moment. Uh, but that's just a transit. It'll transition to leadership at some point during it, during, uh, during a market. It's just a matter of time, which is why diversification is so important. Um, okay. It is 1244. Anything else you guys want to cover? feel like we need to add. You guys have been remarkable. I've loved the conversation. Uh, I've learned um, a lot. Um, and that really, I think wraps it up for, for the group. Um, one quick announcement. We've teamed up with Amigos, Cantina, and Kirkwood. We're going to buy uh, participants uh, a couple of margaritas. Uh, our friend Rich Daniels is the owner of uh, Amigos Cantina. He's a friend of ours uh, here at Crilogy, and um, we're here to support. Uh, it's an amazing restaurant right in the heart of downtown Kirkwood. Uh, so you're going to receive an email uh, from us later on today notification of how to take advantage of two complimentary margaritas when you visit between here and fr between today and Friday. Uh, we hope you go by and enjoy, enjoy a wonderful meal like at uh, Migos. So with that, uh, thank you so much to St. Louis Magazine, Kim Moore, Joanna Reed. Uh, you guys are amazing. We really appreciate uh, the opportunity to work with you um, and uh, your support in hosting what's next for your financial health. Thank you all. You guys have a wonderful day. Bye-bye. Thanks, guys. <laughs>